So as Jason was saying, um, this is part of a book project uh, where Spectres of the Dead wander a study of Blake's family and neighbors. And this chapter considers Stephen Horncastle, who lived across the street from the Blake for 30 years, but who has received scant critical attention for reasons I'll explain in a moment. As I hope to demonstrate, Horncastle and his family should be considered important members of Blake's early biography. Before I say more, however, I want to just start with a brief overview of the Blake family neighborhood. As most of us probably know, a member of the Blake family lived at 28 Broad Street from 1746 to 1812, and the importance of the vicinity has long been emphasized in Blake's studies. Next door at 27 Broad Street, Blake and James Parker had their short-lived print shop. William and Catherine lived for a time at 28 uh, Poland Street. Thomas and Elizabeth Butts lived at 9 Great Marlboro Street. And when Blake returned home after his apprenticeship, Fuseli was already living at the corner of Poland and Broad Streets. But given this close attention to Blake's neighborhood, it is almost unbelievable that no Blake scholar was aware of Stephen Horncastle's existence until the 21st century. This oversight was the result, unfortunately, of a rare blunder by G.E. Bentley. In both editions of Blake records, Bentley wrongly asserted that Blake's brother's jo brother John lived at 29 Broad Street from 1784 to 1793, with John being the one whom Blake described as the evil one in his black cloud, making his mon. Given Bentley's error, when Angus Whitehead noticed in 2005 that Horncastle was listed at 29 Broad Street in a 1785 directory, he assumed that Horncastle was likely John Blake's tenant. It was not until the 2019 catalog of the recent Tate exhibition that Martin Myrone and Amy Con Cannon clarified who the resident of 29 Broad Street was. They listed Horncastle among Blake's neighbors and pointed out that he possessed the lease for 30 Broad Street for a time as well. But since their catalog does not give precise dates, it should be pointed out from the rate books that Horncastle was at 29 Broad Street from September 1759 to April 1789, and that he paid rates at 30 Broad Street from April 1767 to April 1788. For his part, John Blake lived in a resident, residence rated at only nine pounds, making it one of the cheapest in the area and the survey of Lord Craven's estates even describes 6 Marshall Street as very small. But I want to show today that there remains a great deal more to uncover about Horncastle and his family. I will highlight three major reasons why the Horncastles are important. The first is that Horncastle and both of his wives were born in and had long lasting connections to the same area of Yorkshire from which Thomas Armitage, the first husband of Blake's mother originated, and that Horncastle's areas, area of Yorkshire bordered the western region, region of Nottinghamshire where Blake's mother was born. The second reason is that Horncastle was a paper wholesaler and retailer. This point was suspected by Mark Yates, who in his 2014 dissertation discovered that Horncastle was a major rag dealer for the sorry about that, for the um, paper manufacturer James Watman Jr. Given this fact, he also posited that Horncastle might have provided Blake with the Watman paper used in the earliest copies of the songs. New evidence I have uncovered substantiates Yeats's hunch, and it can also be demonstrated that Horncastle sold books, including one with engraved writing. Finally, Horncastle had multiple connections to members of Blake's social and commercial networks as a landlord and leaseholder. These discoveries, I'll suggest, not only reconfigure our sense of Blake's life on Broad Street, but also how his professional network circulated far closer to Blake's family home than has been generally recognized. Let me start then with a brief biographical sketch of Horncastle. He was christened on January 23, 1725 in South Elmsall, Yorkshire. 
in June 1742, a butcher who also lived in South Elmsall paid the duty on Horncastle's apprenticeship. It seems likely that Horncastle finished his apprenticeship as a butcher, since when he lived on Broad Street, he was listed as a member of the livery who voted and served on juries. The first record of Horncastle outside of Yorkshire occurs when he marries Susanna Fors on January 6, 1754 in the parish of St. James, Westminster. It is likely that she was the woman of that name christened on October 9, 1726 in South Kirby, just two miles away from South Elmsall. The two may have been in the parish for some time by this date, since in the bands, both are identified as being from the parish of St. James. It is unclear where the couple lived before they moved to 29 Broad Street in September 1759, but it seems they remained in the parish of St. James since their first child, Anne, was christened there in 1757. After their move to Broad Street, the couple had three more children, two daughters and one son, all likewise christened in St. James. Susanna Horncastle died in August 1771, and her death was noted in several newspapers. Sixteen months later, Horncastle married his second wife in the parish of Doncaster, Yorkshire, and they had one son in 1774. In 1780, Horncastle's 17-year-old daughter married a man from Wakefield, and this marriage announcement also appeared in several London papers. In 1789, Horncastle moved his shop and residence to 85 New Bond Street, and after he died in January 1792, his shop was inherited by his son, William, who remained in the trade until 1800. Horncastle was buried with his first wife at St. James Paddington. His grave was significant enough to be mentioned in Daniel Lyson's description of the churchyard in his book, The Environs of London. Licensed drawing of the Horncastle Monument has been preserved at the Yale Center for British Arts, though I have not been able to verify if it remains standing in the churchyard. Most London papers noted Horncastle's passing, with his fullest obituary appearing in the Morning Chronicle. As this is the only description of Horncastle, I'll read it in full. On Saturday the 14th, died at his host house in New Bond Street, Mr. Stephen Horncastle, stationer, whose uprightness and friendship were most admired by those who knew him best. He is left by his former wife, five children, and by his present disconsolate widow, one, and who, though left in affluence, are those who will feel, most feel and do most lament the loss of so good a father and so good a man. To my ears, at least, this seems like an honest expression of affection and grief. As neighbors of Horncastle for 30 years, the members of the Blake family were presumably among those who also knew him best, and perhaps they shared this affection and grief. At least for Blake's mother, this affection and sense of loss becomes more likely given her common regional identity with Horncastle and his wives. In this slide, you can see the rough locations of Cudworth and Walkeringham, where Thomas Armitage and Catherine Blake were born. These two villages are separated by a little more than 30 miles. Now, in this slide, you can see the locations in the Yorkshire associated with Horncastle and his family. While there is no indication that Thomas Armitage and Stephen Horncastle ever met, with Armitage dying in 1751, Cudworth in South Elmsall, where the men were born, are only seven miles apart. Campsall, where Horncastle had a freehold estate, was only six miles farther east. And Duncaster, where Horncastle's second wife was from, is only 17 miles from Catherine Blake's Walkeringham. All of this suggests that the region of Catherine Blake's birth was not as far at, from her life on Broad Street as we might assume. And though there is no material record of contact between Blake and the Horncastle families, this common bond makes the idea of friendship between the families more likely. It also seems possible, though certainly not proven, 
that Catherine Blake might have gone the 150 miles north on occasion with her affluent neighbors to visit her own family. Turning to my second point, Horncastle's professional activities and networks overlapped much with Blake's own. First, Horncastle sold at least a few books. Between 1758 and 1765, Horncastle was listed as one of the many sellers of Thomas Gurney's shorthand manual, The Kigraphy, first published in 1750. These advertisements ran in both newspapers and in the proceedings of the Old Bailey, where Gurney worked as the recorder. Significantly, many of the other, other sellers listed in the advertisement advertisements were among the most important dissenting publishers at the time. For the third edition, these included George Keith, James Buckland, Edward and Charles Dilley, and Jacob Robinson. For the fourth and fifth editions, they were joined by James Rivington, John Payne, Samuel Noble, and most importantly, a young Joseph Johnson. How substantial Horncastle's connections were to these dissenting publishers is not known. Horncastle's later activities suggest he was an Orthodox Anglican, and I could find no references to Horncastle as a seller of any of their other publications. But Horncastle clearly participated in this publishing congery in some fashion for over five years, and it potentially put a host of publishing and religious networks right across the street from the Blakes. This group may have included Gurney himself, who is quite active in selling his book, inviting buyers and practitioners of his shorthand system to come to his home. Gurney would have been of great interest to the young Blake. He had married the daughter of a man imprisoned with John Bunyan, a particular Baptist. Gurney was also a poet who wrote satirical religious poems aimed at John Wesley. Gurney was also a friend and correspondent of Erasmus Darwin's, who himself was a practitioner of Gurney's shorthand. Gurney's children were radical publishers, and his daughter, Martha, was mentored by and later published books with Mary Lewis, the main bookseller for the Moravians. Bikigraphy is also interesting because almost all of its pages had engraved writing. While there are many books at this time with engraved writing, the chances of this being the first book of its type seen by Blake are very high. Certainly I want to stress that Blake was not a writing engraver and that illuminated printing first developed as a means of reproducing images rather than text. But the book would have shown Blake there was another way of book production and it might have spurred his interest in the potential of engraving. Gurney's book also contains shorthand transcriptions of biblical verses done by those endorsing his system, including Darwin. Such encoding of the Bible may have defamiliarized scripture to Blake at an early age and done so in a way that spurred his consciousness of the text's materiality and obscured the differences between the visual and the verbal. These marks also seem to anticipate Blake's early attempts to replicate Hebrew script in his art before he began to learn the actual language. Even though Horncastle's work as, the, as a bookseller of bacrigraphy reveals his earliest activities as a stationer, he does not appear to have sold many books. The only other book I could find linked to Horncastle is a 1773 sales catalog of the bookseller and stationer Joseph White. But even here, there are some interesting coincidences tied to Blake. White resided at the corner of Lincoln Inn Fields, not far from James Bazaar, where with whom Blake was living as an apprentice. The catalog was also published during the period of Bazaar's and James Watman's most extensive contact over the production of the antiquarian paper necessary for the large engravings Bazaar was doing for the Society of Antiquaries. At this time, Horncastle was likely already providing rags to Watman and selling Watman paper. But this cannot be asserted with absolute certainty since, as Yates highlights, there is only one surviving ledger of the Watman Turkey paper mills dating from 1780 to 1787. Still, 
This surviving ledger reveals that Horncastle was a major rag provider to Watman, who sold to Watman about 25 tons of rags per year. The rag business was quite lucrative for Horncastle, and he was paid 342 pounds by Watman in 1783 alone. It also seems certain that Horncastle sold paper at this time as well. An advertisement which dates from 1790 emphasizes that Horncastle sells all sorts of stationery, wholesale and retail. And it called a special attention to the fact he sold every kind of drawing paper. While this advertisement is for his new shop at 85 New Bond Street, the reference to his previous address at the bottom of the page indicates that his business remained this largely the same. This adds a great deal of weight to Yates's theory that Horncastle sold Blake the Watman paper used in the first copy, first two copies of the Songs of Innocence. In addition, the fact that Horncastle highlights every kind of drawing paper suggests that his shop specifically offered paper designed for artists. This surely would have attracted those who lived in the Broad Street area, and it means in short that artists would have been frequenting an immediate neighbor of the Blakes for the first 30 years of his life. The last set of points I want to make about Horncastle involves a substantial number of lease holdings and how many of his tenants included or had dealings with members of Blake's family. I'm sorry, Blake's circle. To start closest to home, Horncastle had known had two tenants at 30 Broad Street, both of whom were connected to music. The first of these was Arnold Frederick Beck, who lived at 30 Broad Street from 1767 to 1771, or from when Blake was 10 to 14 years old. Beck made piano fortes, and the one picture is dated to 1770s, which means it was made across the street from the Blakes and probably heard by the 13-year-old Blake. Beck would later move to 10 Broad Street, where his presence has long been noted. The second tenant, as noted by the Tate catalog, was Francis Werner, who lived at 30 Broad Street from 1776 to 1781. A composer, instrument maker, and dance master at nearby Almax, where the macaroni vogue began, Werner sewed his publications from 30 Broad Street attracting the stylish audience to the Blake family neighborhood as Blake was returning home from his apprenticeship late in the summer of 1779. Werner may explain many, Blake's many connections to figures associated with the macaroni vogue, like Richard Cosway, Joseph Banks, and John Hunter. Both Beck, Beck's and Werner's presence suggests the possible connections that Blake might have had to the world of professional music in the 1780s, a time during which John T. Smith recalled Blake wrote songs with tunes noted down by musical professors. Another tenant of Horncastle's who was connected to music, but who did not live at the corner of Broad Street, was the publisher Robert Burkall. While Burkall is not known for his connections to Blake, in 1783, Burkall published musical works by Werner and Maria Cosway, and he also employed James Parker to engrave his trade card. This was right before Parker himself moved to Broad Street, where he became a neighbor of, neighbor of Horncastle's as well. Five years later, when Burkall moved his shop from 129 to 133 Broad Street, uh, I'm sorry, Bond Street, his landlord just happened to be Stephen Horncastle. Another tenants of Horncastle's, or more properly his heirs, with connections to Blake and his circle, was William Fordyce, the brother of James Fordyce, the friend of William Haley and John Flaxman. William Fordyce moved into Horncastle's leasehold at 53 Book Street in March of 1792, just a few months after Horncastle had died. While Fordyce's place in Blake's circle is overshadowed by his brothers, William Fordyce was among the audience of Thomas Taylor's 1787 lecture on Platonism alongside Flaxman, George Romney, and Maria Cosway, 
and Fordyce corresponded with Flaxman in Italy. Horncastle's many other lease holdings and their occupants were enumerated by his will, and these leaseholds passed on to their, his children. As this list suggests, Horncastle was a wealthy man. But what I want to end on is how Horncastle and his family reconfigure our understanding of Blake's relationship to New Bond Street in the 1790s. This slide shows the Bond Street booksellers and publishers associated with Blake's Night Thoughts, which was published in late 1797. Key, of course, is Richard Edwards at number 142, and his brother James, who traded in Pall Mall, was also important. But we also know from advertisements and catalog listings that as Richard Edwards was leaving the business, Falder, Clark, and Robson offered the book and accepted subscription for the subsequent volumes that were never published. Without knowledge of Horncastle and his family, we would be led to believe that their efforts stemmed more from their close proximity to Edwards and less from their association with Blake. However, if we look at the family members and tenants of Horncastle in the same area at the same time, we see their substantial presence. Anne Horncastle, a woman Blake had known his whole life, lived a block away from Richard Edwards' shop, and her brother William lived and traded a block beyond that. Now, if we overlay the two slides, we can see the degree to which these networks coincide. William Clark at 38 New Bond Street is especially interesting since he is both a seller of Night Thoughts and a tenant of William Horncastle. Given his long association with William Horncastle, Blake cannot be considered a plebeian interloper in this bookscape, despite the little he was paid for his Night Thoughts work. Moreover, as a paper wholesaler and retailer like his father, William Horncastle may have been involved in the production of Night Thoughts himself. I would propose, based on his proximity to Edwards' shop and his relationship to Blake, that Horncastle may have even been the supplier of the Watman paper that made up Blake's Night Thoughts engravings, and which provided the stock from which Blake drew for many years, including for the four Zoas. Finally, might these networks of New Bond Street even have been among the reasons that Blake moved to 17 South Moulton Street in 1804. While no longer across the street from one another, Blake and William Horncastle are once again in surprisingly close proximity. And though Horncastle had retired from the stationary trade by 1800, the last coincidence I'll point out is the fact that the first person Horncastle rented to and who was living at 85 New Bond Street in 1804 was an ironmonger, William Armitage, who just happened to share the last name as Catherine Blake's first husband. Perhaps the only reference to the Horncastle family in Blake's writing is an obscure notebook poem, Swelled Limbs with No Outline, from which I drew my title. The poem appears to be crammed under satirical squibs on Haley and Reynolds, so it probably dates from the last part of the first decade of the 19th century, and perhaps even during Blake's 1809 exhibition, when he would have been at 28 Broad Street more often. In the poem, Blake associates the lack of outlines with the stink of a paper mill whose pulp has been washed and finished by journeymen as paper. Given the Horncastle connection to rags, paper production, and paper sales, the turn to a neighbor at the end of the poem seems to inquire, perhaps of William Horncastle, his thought about the type of the bad type of art that journeymen would put on the paper he sold. Or, if it is a more specific criticism, perhaps it is a criticism of something Horncastle bought, or if it was written during the exhibition, Perhaps something Horncastle did not buy, since I could find no trace of any Blake items owned by the Horncastles or their descendants. Still, if it is a criticism, 
for Blake's notebook, I think we can agree it's rather muted. In conclusion, then, I think it, I hope it has been shown that the Horncastles were a significant presence for Blake and his family during a time for which information remains scarce. Thank you.